like he knew more than me and he was better than me, more successful than me, that I was never going to be able to achieve any of that. And uh, if I spent much more time around him, you know, it, eventually he'd convinced me not to run my business anymore. And although he wasn't saying that, he was trying to help me in hindsight. He wasn't trying to tell me not to bother. He was trying to give me ideas on how to make it successful. But I just couldn't see that. It was all about doing it wrong. So it sounds like you were kind of scared and, and, and as you say, threatened by him. Yeah, I would say most definitely I was, yeah. A lot, a, lot, a lot older person and a man as well. And I know that sounds funny, but I hadn't had a great experience with men in my life. So um, I wasn't going to trust one at that, that time either. Welcome to Beyond the Fail, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. Lisa Tennant is a seasoned entrepreneur and leader, having founded two businesses and led a small charity and has over 20 years of experience. Today, she shares her experience in founding a laundry business, where for eight years, she did everything herself, not delegating or taking on any staff, stifling business growth. This impacted her personal life, barely having any time off or holidays, and even still having to work when her son was in, in intensive care. Lisa candidly shares how her traumatic childhood led to the business decisions that she was making in a very frank and honest conversation. This is Beyond the Fail with Lisa Tennant. Lisa, thanks so much for joining me today. Really looking forward to um, our conversation. So Lisa, take us back where did it all start for you in business? Do you know what? If you want to go right back, I was always trying to start businesses, even when I was a child. So I'd, I'd have some wacky idea. I think I started a kid's pub in my nan and granddad's back garden once. <laughs> Illegal, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we didn't sell alcohol. It was just, I think I just wanted those people around me. So it was always in me, but I started my first business um, in 2004, uh, which was a laundry company. And... I did that because I was working at the time. I'd split up, split up with a partner and I had to support myself in a new property. And um, I just thought I'd do a bit of ironing to begin with on the side uh, alongside my income. But I've always been one of these people that tends to turn things into something bigger than they originally were meant to be. And just doing someone's ironing wasn't enough for me. So I thought, well, I could you know, really do something with this. And then ended up turning it into a proper domestic and commercial business uh, and quit my job and and ran it full time for 10 years in the end. Amazing. And it's good to see the, um, interesting to see the kind of trajectory you went on from children's pubs um, or, you know, a, ch a child's pub to, <laughs> to that laundry business. Just going back though to, because it obviously it sounded like you were, um, you know, a kind of keen entrepreneur from an early age. What kind of prompted that, do you think? Do you know what? I think it was my nan. I was brought up by my grandparents, strict Irish Catholics, and uh, we didn't have an easy life at all. But I watched her. She ran her own uh, couple of businesses. She ran a cleaning business, which, uh, you know, she um, used us as child labour from the age of 11 <laughs> to work on it. Uh, and, uh, but I've got, I've got no regrets about that because it taught me a lot about uh, hard work and graft and then um, she also she was a, a qualified chef she was a brilliant chef and she owned her own calf uh, for many years so I remember spending lots of time there uh, usually you know under her feet she, she'd send us off to the park with a egg sandwich and uh, <laughs> to tell us to come back later um, and she ran that for a long time and then eventually she lost that calf and um, but she she was must have been an, an entrepreneur entrepreneur herself so she then started selling pies that she made in pubs and things. So she was always doing something. And I think that kind of inspired me. Mm. But more than anything, I just wanted to be free. And I felt that I think it was always in me to want to work for myself because I like being, I don't want to be tied down and, and feel like I've got those chains on me that I think employment um, offers, so to speak. And there's strong words, you know, chains uh, as well. Um, and I might come back to that. I was just intrigued. You said your um, nan lost her cafe business. What happened there? 
I don't know the full story. All I do know is they got turfed out by the tax man. Uh, so it was something to do with that. And she's no longer with us, bless us, though. Obviously, I can't upset everyone. But uh, it was something to do with that. Um, unfortunately, I think it was something to do with taxes. But I don't really know the full story. I was too young to understand it. And it sounded like she was a grafter and you mentioned how you learned hard work from her. What else did you learn from yeah. her being around, you know, her and running those businesses? Um, it's tricky because um, there, there were great times living with an animal granted. I moved out a week after I turned 16. I was determined to leave that, that situation and started working at 15 in a fish and chip shop. I finished school before my GCSEs. Uh, I just wanted to to be out of that situation and this was the only way um but my nan was she was somebody who um she'd been through a lot so she was her path in life she wanted to be a nun uh when she was in ireland and that's what she was doing and then when her mother died she was told to go and live in england and all of the children were sent to england to yeah have a better life and she had to put up with a lot um over the years i think she met my granddad she got married uh, he wasn't an easy person at all. So, and neither was she really. But um, she had to raise the children, try to run the, run a business, and um, and things like that. But she'd also in those days. I mean, back in the what seventies, eighties, um, probably sixties, seventies. They were dealing with the the stigma of the IRA. So, you know, just like nowadays, there's modern terrorists of today, and the children in schools are being bullied to say things like you're a terrorist she she had that with her children and at one point um they had to be sent home because they were from an irish family and not to come in for a while because it was so mm. hot and she looked she was kind of a fighter really and i think um i think she taught me resilience in that way uh for, de for, for definite and yeah i think that's i think that's where it comes from my now well yeah i mean that's a it's definitely a great word to use. I would say grit as well, because, you know, it's certainly, you know, dealing with a lot there um, and kind of sounds like a fascinating story as well. You know, wanting to grow up a, or wanting to become a nun and then, and then obviously not seeing that through and then having a life in England, which was obviously vastly different from, um, you know that life you know what would have happened to her in um in in kind of Ireland yeah so it didn't I think this is always an interesting question as well because you know being around business at that age and seeing people grafting can yeah. actually go the opposite way and actually put people off from becoming their own um yeah. and becoming founders themselves actually so yeah so yeah. did that ever put you off or was it always a clear kind of goal of yours to want to work for yourself it was never a clear goal of mine I think it was a combination of things I my my early childhood before living with my nan and one of the reasons we lived with our grandparents was we had a difficult um childhood with mom and dad and we subsequently ended up being quite literally thrown onto the streets at the age I was nine uh, when um, my stepdad decided that we were garbage. And so my life was very much about wanting to be free and knowing from a young age that I was going to change uh, my, my path. It wasn't going to continue like this. And so there was that element of always wanting to be free that I'm still very much like that now as a person. I, I'm quite aware of uh, the concept that we're all going to die one day and that you have to live your life. People say it, but they don't really know what it means, I don't think. And so um, I've done some radical things, like I've, you know, lived in a caravan and took the kids out of school and we've travelled around Southeast Asia and had a wonderful time. But I'm not afraid to do things like that. And I think that just comes from knowing how worse it could be, surviving more than anything and just wanting that freedom. And then I think actually I didn't really... Uh, respect the fact that my nan was grafting as much as she was. I did because we had to work really hard too, but I, I wasn't inspired by her to run a business because my nose was always in a book. I was just off in fairyland, you know, so that was my way of coping. It wasn't until, but it, but it must have been in me though. I must have been emulating her in some ways, you know, starting that pub was in her back garden, for example. Um, so I think it was just 
maybe a way to want to earn a bit of money that was going to make me more free. So money, I think, is the, the thing, isn't it? But I say that, and, and even now, I'm just like most business owners where you just can't stop. It's You can have all the money in the world, but you still need to keep going. And it's, it's I don't know, I think it's something in you that um, you, you're in control of your own destiny almost. And I think I'm more addicted to that. Mm. Is that a, uh, you know, is that a consequence of essentially not ever feeling in control when you were a child, do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think definitely it is. Yeah, I need to feel like um, I'm choosing what I'm doing. And even I had a break. So after I sold my business in 2004, I managed a charity for eight years. And so although it wasn't technically my business, I still turned that into something that became more or less my business. It was like profit making and and we had to put all that back in because obviously it was a charity and I suppose we're making any profit. And um, I think that's just the way I am as a person. I don't, I don't know what, what you know, what it is and where it comes from, but I would say there is an element of wanting to be in control and, and not be told what to do really. You said that you can't help it and it's just that you're just that kind of person. What would you describe yourself as? And what, what, what is it that you're kind of trying to define there? I think I'm a, a driven person and I also, I think I know what's important and what's not in life. And so for me, it's not about, it's not even about money. Uh, it's just about having a, a balance and a quality. Now, the big thing for me is work-life balance. It's it's choosing that if I need to take my children to an appointment, I can. It's choosing what time I start, what time I finish, uh, having days off when I want to, and having that freedom that a job cannot give me, employment will not give me that. And I think that we, we're we all living in a lie, really. You know, we were institutionalised, we're taught at school to just get in line. That's what that's what school's all about, get in line, and then you're not going to argue when you go out there into the real world. And you think that your job in life is to buy a nice house and, and, and have a mortgage and do this. It's all a big, fat lie, and I don't want to be part of it, quite frankly. Strong, strong words. And just interesting that you mentioned you've got kids. Is that something you're trying to teach them as well? Absolutely, yeah. So we homeschooled them for three years. The only reason they're at senior school now is because they wanted to go after our travels. And um, and we concentrated a lot on, on talking about that in, you know, when we homeschooled. And even now they might come home and it's all, you can tell it's already in them by the things they say. You know, they talk about homework. I don't believe in homework. I think it's the biggest part of bull crap I've ever heard of in my life. If you can't learn in six hours at school what you need to learn, then something is wrong with, with the teaching system. And my children deserve to come home and spend time with their family. It was one of the reasons I didn't want them to go back to school because I hated that. You end up in this place where you're rushing out the door in the morning and you're screaming at the kids and then you're coming home and you've got to do homework. Where's the bedtime cuddles gone? Where has the bedtime stories gone? What do you, you don't have time anymore as a family. That's fundamentally wrong in my opinion. And I'll make sure my kids know that. So what I don't disrespect teachers and what they do, because it is an important job, there has to be a balance. And so I will not be one of these parents um, that is told what to do by the school in the sense of homework and things like that. So with the kids, it's very much, look, I mean, I'm not being funny, I'll put it to you like this. One of them's in year seven, one's in year eight, and they're already worrying about GCSEs. What the hell? So I'm like, it's not worrying about it. It doesn't matter if you don't pass them anywhere. You can take them again. Don't worry, it's going to be fine. Like, I just think it's ridiculous. So yeah, the kids definitely. No, 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 no. I, I think you can. You you definitely made that clear. Well, th- talking about this this kind of laundry um, business then, and that was your kind of first foray into, um, you know, working for yourself. I, I suppose just interestingly, what happened in those preceding years between you being in that fish and working that fish and ship shop at like 16 to this starting this laundry business in 2004 what was it that led you to start that business then rather than at any point in the you know in the previous years so what happened was i met somebody who was quite a bit older than i was uh and i was still quite young and impressionable mm-hmm. and i think he was he was almost a father father figure and uh, he always wanted to live in Weymouth. I've never been there. And I did. We moved. I'd never been there and we moved to Weymouth. So I quit my job. And then I started working in sales, uh, selling windows, doors, conservatories. And I found that I was actually really good at it. But that relationship was 
was an abusive one. It wasn't a good experience. And I was kind of trapped there for a while. And we came back a year later and uh, he wanted to take um, a course in HDB loss, get his HDB license. And he needed to do that uh, through the job centre. So because we were a couple, I couldn't work for a while until he did that or he wouldn't have got that for free. Right. So he did that. And once that was done, I decided to go. I wanted to work in, um, in like, I think it, it was every girl's kind of dream at some point um, to work in an office and, you know, on a computer because computers were all, you know, they were getting bigger and bigger and the internet was coming out. And so I did a Clake course at the time, um, got that and then got a job as a um, PA admin assistant. Uh, and that's kind of the reason I hadn't started a business up until that point because I was just, again, surviving in this in this world that I was in um so it was in that job uh the admin job that I ended up then starting the business alongside it but again that was born from a place of I needed to survive because I'd I had a new partner by then we'd split up I was moving out and I needed a, another income stream uh the pay at that job wasn't great at all so yeah so yeah it was the it was money driven basically it was a, as you say it was a survival motivation yeah. and um driver yeah it was at that point and then and then I just got really addicted to it I just really fell in love with running my own business and even though it was I, I made so many mistakes it was so stupid when I look back that I spent 10 years grafted 24 hours a day seven days a week I still loved that it was mine and that's a feeling I just think you can't be so how did that first few years go in that business Oh God, it was brutal. It was so hard. It really was. I mean, especially when I, I was employed alongside it, you literally did a full day and then got home and, and worked again all night. And uh, it was really, really difficult. And it just didn't get any easier, I'll be honest with you. It, it never got easy because, and the reason is, I tried to do everything on my own. And you can't do everything on your own when you're running a business. Not if you want to scale it, you can't. Um, and that was my my biggest mistake and you don't really realize in until you've got hindsight um where your mistakes were it wasn't until eight years in I had my son and that was a difficult circumstance that I realized I needed to step back and and do something that's only because he ended up in intensive care for three months and even the night before I was having him I was working and I worked you know while he was in hospital visiting him and I look back now and think, God, it was just such a stupid thing to do. But I made all those mistakes of taking on family members. They're not qualified or equipped to do to do the job. It was just safer. And I think it's just when you're when you're inexperienced in that way, you're fearful of um, kind of putting yourself out there, trusting people. Um, and so you go for the what you think is the easy route. And that's what I did. I, I chose people that were wrong. I mean, at one point, I even... Uh, said to my cousin that she could be the business partner with me and she was like a kid really and let her loose with a bank card. I went away for a few months, came back to no money literally. No way. <laughs> so grave mistakes that I've made. <laughs> well, how much did she spend? What was I just emptied the bank account? It was a good, you know, couple of thousand pounds. But again, this was a situation. I was sort of supporting myself through this business so I, I couldn't pay my bills and I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? But... She herself was young and, and she hadn't meant to, like, steal from me or anything. She just got a bit card happy and thought it was, like, an endless pit of money and it, and it wasn't. Um, I'm intrigued. Still... What did she buy? I don't know what she bought. I think it was, like, some food and some clothes. I don't have no clue what she actually bought. I can't even remember. It was so long ago, but I was just devastated. Devastated when that happened. <laughs> And take us there, like what you know, what impact did that have? That 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 mistake have on you at the time? It was a, a huge impact because at the time I'd been I'd just been granted a Prince's Trust grant, and uh, and so the money wasn't then used for the right things because I needed to survive and that money had gone, so um, it had to some of that money had to be used to just help me, you know, survive and pay the bills. But also because I was in that place where I hadn't taken on the, the people I needed and I and I couldn't grow, 
I couldn't really invest it the way it was meant to be invested anyway. So it kind of just got whittled away over time, which is a shame. I really, I still think about that today and what might have been had I invested it the way it was intended to, to, to be invested. On what grounds did you apply for that grant? What Because obviously you have to, uh, I imagine, uh, done some kind of application when you said, I want yeah. this grant for doing X. So was that meant to be used to grow the business? Yeah, it was meant to be to invest in a unit uh, and equipment in that unit. Um, but yeah, sadly, it, I never ended up going down that route at all. And I just carried on slogging away the way I did for, for years and years. Um, some of that money was invested in the end in, in the equipment that was needed, but it was all from home. So it wasn't, you know, I could never really grow the business on an industrial level like I was aiming to. So yeah, lot, lots to kind of um, kind of unpack there. Um, one question I did have was how, you said you were employed at the time uh, and in running to two things in parallel. How long did that go on for? Probably about 18 months, something like that. Oh. And then I was making more money in my business than I was in my job. Mm. And I thought, you know, it's a no-brainer. I, I took the leap of faith. You know, you, you haven't got as much capacity when you're employed. I know lots of people do it. When you're employed as well as running a business, you haven't got that capacity yet. So you have to take the leap of faith and know that you're going to fill up that part that you've just left behind. And, and I knew that would. So so I did. It was great. Got it. Got it. So you, you took that leap of faith. How, how many kind of clients did you have at, uh, at the time? Like, you know, what did the kind of work look like? So at the time, we start. I started with um, just doing people's ironing. So I'd travel all over. I, I, I bought a van, uh, like a combi van to begin with. And uh, I'd travel all over doing that. I used to do it in a car first and hang it all up in a car. I got a broom style wow. and like put it across the two, you know, the handrails at the back so I could hang everything up in there. And uh, I did that for a while. And so, God, how many clients are there? I don't know. This was before people were really doing it. And so... I. You didn't have social media. It was all leaflet dropping, mm. and it just did really well. So I, I had a I had a lot of clients, and and it was just me doing it. So, um, but then what happened was I got I got into the wedding industry. So um, and no, and it's kind of a niche. Nobody else was doing it, and so the chair covers and the tablecloths that they use in the weddings, not the stretch ones, but the, the cotton ones, uh, they need ironing all the time and turned around. So uh, I was like, I can do that. And so I started doing that. And at that point, that's when like, my cousin kind of came in to start helping with the ironing. But honestly, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be genuinely honest. I do not know how I did it. I look back now and I think there would be normally about 100 and odd chair covers to do. And you're doing that every day alongside people's ironing. Sometimes I'd get like a family member to help out. But I, I still look back and just can't, I don't know how, like, I really don't know how I did it. And it grew and it grew and I ended up driving a massive van. Um, it was all like rigged out to to carry all these chair covers all over the West Midlands, uh, which was great. But um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I've, uh, lots of clients, but I can't tell you the number, to be honest. I just can't believe I managed them all the way over. So no, I mean, obviously that sounds really physically demanding as well as obviously mentally demanding. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, you were doing everything yourself, right? You were doing the physical delivery of the of the, the business, yeah. which was, you know, the ironing and the, and the kind of um, yeah. the the, the, the covers, the laundry. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't think of the word. Yeah. And as well as everything else in that business, right? Business development, marketing, yeah, yeah, marketing finance, plans, everything. Yeah, myself. And so I basically just literally did work from like. Six o'clock in the morning till probably midnight every single day, um, weekends. And if I went on holiday, if I was lucky enough to go away, it could only be for a week because I couldn't take that time off in case my clients left me. Mm. And well, I'd still be answering emails and calls then as well. It's just crazy. No, I mean, that is intense. That is definitely intense. Mm. Uh, did that ever have any kind of, I mean, obviously you were young, so is you going to be able to cope with it a bit better, right? But did that ever, yeah. you know, have any toll on you? Did that ever cause any, you know, like burnout? Like, you know, did you get ill? Because you, when you're, you know, it's that intense, you're not having days off and everything like that. I'm surprised you didn't, yeah. you know, there wasn't something. You know what? There probably was a lot looking back. I think the thing is, I've 
I've fostered as well. So I know a lot about the, the way a child's brain works from going through traumatic childhood and that you can live in a high state of stress. I think I live well in a high state of stress all the time so I can cope with it better uh, than some people might be able to. The only, the only problem is it does take its toll. You just don't notice that it's taking its toll. Um, but I never felt... There were times I'd cry. I'd cry and think I can't do this anymore. Don't get me wrong, that happened, especially if I felt like... Um, I remember times I hadn't quite met an order or, or I wasn't going to get there on time. I was going to be delayed and I was letting people down. And that would be highly stressful, really stressful. But it never like put me in hospital or anything like that. It's had an effect on me physically. Um, now I have problems with my neck and my back from the hours of standing and doing all of that work for so long. But um, I think like you said, I was young and quite resilient uh, and could manage it quite well that way. But once I got to my now husband and I met him, I think it definitely did kind of impact that a lot more then because... I had less time to do things than than I would have liked. Mm, no, of course. So, was there any point that you that you took on any help to you know at least to do some of the ironing, take some of the literally take some of the load off you? Yeah, I did in the end. So we knew that we wanted to have a child, and uh, we were we we'd have to have our yeah. And so I did start to take on um, some. Uh, subcontractor so there were ladies working from home they needed a bit of income and I'd go and dro start dropping off the chair covers in particular to them uh, but I still retired a lot of it myself and I'd started to work with hotels as well um, and self-service departments so it was growing and growing in that way and I had I had, had a workshop built for me in um, the bottom of our garden so that was all that was where I did most of the work and luckily I had the room for industrial equipment uh, at the time but I still didn't fully outsource. I always outsourced dry cleaning. Obviously, I couldn't do that. Um, but but I still, you know, kept it all for myself until I was seven months pregnant. And then I found out that the baby was probably not going to make it. And if he did, he was going to have a real struggle. And I realized there was no way I was going to be able to, to cope uh, the way I was. So I employed a van driver, and that was my very first employee. In fact, because I work from home, we had an entryway that he entered through and we had a pocketing machine, then he clocked in. <laughs> I'd leave like, the shift out for him every day. Uh, well, I say him, it was a woman to begin with and my son was about a week old and I'm, I'm in this hor horrible situation where he's in intensive care and she let me down. So I had to step back in for a little while. I'd had a C-section, I was still driving and, um, and then got this guy in and he was fantastic and he stayed with me until I closed the business down. Um, and then I subcontracted um, all of the, the ironing to, to all, about 10, 10 women and then a laundrette. And so basically I still did um, a little bit of it, but most of it at that point then just got completely outsourced. Um, and it was better. I, you know, I earned more money. <laughs> it's just crazy. I think it's because obviously my capacity grew. I just couldn't see that the eight years previously. <laughs> So was that a kind of pivotal moment in terms of yeah, you know, your, the whole with, with the the stress, I suppose, and the anxiety around you know your your baby, and did that yeah. kind of shift your mindset? Oh, absolutely! You know, nothing was more important than that. Um, it didn't matter anymore. What you know, it just didn't matter. I just. I just didn't have the time to sell the business. I was kind of caught out because here I am, I'm pregnant. I can't just drop the business. I, I, I didn't want to run it for that long and then just drop it. So I knew I'd have to stick with it for a while until I could get to a point where I could exit exit the business. Um, so, yeah, it had a massive impact. And, and who knows what I would have been doing if uh, I might still be there now trying to do it myself if that hadn't have happened. <laughs> and had you, cons you know, had you considered you know, bringing on more staff before that? Or was it that you were kind of forced into taking on more staff because obviously, you you know, you had a baby and then obviously couldn't be, you know, spending nine hours ironing? Yeah, I was forced into it really. And the problem is I wasn't around business-minded people at all. That might have guided me in a different direction and advised me. You know, one of the things I love now is I network a lot. 
and it's quite um, cathartic when you're around other business people that kind of get you in a way your family and your friends don't and then you really do learn and you get advice and you get ideas uh, that I just didn't have back then so there was no one there saying to me you know maybe you ought to get some help it, it was just me figuring my way through it all so yeah I think I was kind of forced into it um, but I'm so glad that I was I really am it's taught me a lot and I mean you already touched on it a little bit but yeah if if you hadn't have made that change what do you think how do you think it would have played out in your business I think I would have the business would have folded in the end there's no way I would have been able to carry on I might have sold it who knows but um I couldn't have continued the way I was going for much longer um, and it was really funny because I, I'm not a person who can do nothing. It's just not in me. So when I did sell the business, um, I probably had a week off and then I started volunteering because I just need to keep keep going and keep doing things. Uh, and that's kind of probably why I stuck at it for so long because I couldn't imagine doing that. Mm. So just thought of thinking about, and obviously this is you know a podcast about business failure. What would you say was the, the biggest failure point in that because i'm th i presume we're talking about the first eight years of that business right yeah that's right that's right i, I, I sold it in the end well I, actually what i did was i i split it in i kind of split it in half so i um just i had a self-service apartments in birmingham that i was working for and i decided to keep them and sell the rest of the business uh because that was a nice income for me and so I did that and it worked really well and, I, you know, it was absolutely brilliant. You, I think you do hit a sweet spot in business where you can you can have too many overheads and not make any money and you can not have enough. And I just hit that right spot where I had just enough overheads and really good profit. But they opened a second site and they wanted me to run it and I knew that I couldn't do the two. There was no compromise at that point. I, I knew what my um, I knew what my self-care was worth at that at then. And so I'd sold that part of the business then as well. Um, and I've forgotten your question now. Yeah, I, I, I was just sort of wondering what your um, the biggest kind of failure point was or what do you think was oh, yeah. the failure of that of those first eight years? And I think it was it was not delegating, it was not getting any help, it was not taking on any advice from people. Uh, the Prince's Trust as well, they give you a mentor. And I kind of was a bit arrogant, I suppose, and, and saw him for a while and thought, oh, and it's, it wasn't arrogance. You know what it was? He knew more than me, and I didn't want somebody to tell me that or I didn't want to feel like I wasn't good enough, you know, kind of like imposter syndrome. So I didn't stick at that for long enough, really, um, because I didn't want to hear I was failing. And actually, I was failing, and that's the truth. Um, so I think for me... It was about it was about not getting that help and and thinking stupidly I could do it all myself. It's something I'm really passionate about now. You know, helping other business owners. I still see it all the time. I have calls with people constantly in this situation, and I just know the way their journey is going to go. And if only they could, if you take that leap of faith, um, yeah, it would it really does make the difference to your to your business. And you said it was you said it was failing. Can you describe what that failure was and what impact did that have? It was income, basically. You know, you were, I was just like, you know, I could just about, I could pay the bills and whatever, but I didn't have any, I didn't have any money to like, you know, be extravagant to buy nice things. I'm lucky that I'm a very humble person. That's just come from my past. And I I, it, I don't think it would matter how much I had. I can't really shake that. I still go to the charity shops. I still make sure the kids only have one slice of ham on the bread. <laughs> very much that kind of person so I think um but I think you know I knew that I wasn't making a massive profit and uh I was never um negative which is great but I just didn't want someone to point that out to me and say actually you know what you're doing here is a non-starter to be honest with you you just the reality is what well, I wasn't running a business I was basically just doing something that was paying me some money to survive yeah you kind of had yourself a, a job in some ways I did. I had a, a you know, a job, a job and a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm intrigued to see whether you thought, and you kind of mentioned it yourself, you said, I, I didn't have many kind of business mentors around me or, you know, 
I, I suppose people that can uh, influence you around you know what good should look like yeah. and I'm intrigued and there's, a, there's definitely a parallel between how you set up there and potentially how you saw your nan set up those two businesses and you essentially saw that running a business at an early age seeing a, your elder running two businesses and it was just about graft yeah yeah that's true and you think that's the norm don't you and and that's what it was i mean when she had a cash she had lots of stuff uh but when she was but i was i was very young then so i think i was in her business world at a time she was freelance chefing you know she was doing catering she was doing the pies that she'd sell to pubs and she was doing the cleaning contracts and we worked for her so you think that's the norm then and i never saw anybody else help her at all so do you think that 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 did shape the way that you thought that business should be run right because you 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 know if we're looking at it of course we don't know what we don't know and and if we've not got anyone to say no, you should be doing it this way. You've only got the blueprint of seeing how your, you know, one of the yeah. your early mentor uh, did it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's very true. And also, it's a pride thing. You kind of feel like uh, it's funny, really. You can feel like asking for help is like, you, you know, it, it's a knock on on your pride. But actually, that's ridiculous. And also, it is that money thing. It's oh god, I got to pay somebody. And you don't, re that could be money in my pocket. Instead of thinking, well, actually, if I release that time and pay that person, I'm going to be able to put my focus elsewhere. But you, I don't think you can, you, do, you don't see that until you've got experience, I don't think. And circling back to what you said about your mentor and the fact that you didn't like to be told, you know, essentially what to do and the fact that you were pointing out mm -hmm. that, you know, you were failing, so you kind of rejected that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that was kind of because there was a lack of trust in, I suppose, authority figures, possibly from your, yeah. your past, and you didn't, and that contradicted the feeling of freedom that you had, you know, running your own business was all about being in control, all about freedom, but there you've got a mentor who is basically kind of saying you're doing it wrong and therefore you're not in control. Do you think yeah. that was a reject a rejection of that influence by your past? Yeah, I, I do. I think now you've said it like that, it makes sense because he was, you know, it made me feel threatened. It made me feel like um, they're gonna, he's gonna take this away from me, and this was the one thing I had that I could control, and it was mine. So I think that definitely. And it, this was a guy who um, he owned commercial properties and and he, he rented them. He came in a suit, you know, and he was. And I still, to this day, I, suffer, I think we all still suffer with imposter syndrome a little bit, but I show up thinking, God, what do I know? And I just didn't like that feeling. It, it wasn't a nice feeling to have. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. And what was that feeling? What did that feel like? Like he knew more than me and he was better than me, more successful than me, that I was never going to be able to achieve any of that. And uh, if I spent much more time around him, you know, it eventually he'd convinced me not to run my business anymore. And although he wasn't saying that, he was trying to help me in hindsight. He wasn't trying to tell me not to bother. He was trying to give me ideas on how to make it successful. But I just couldn't see that. It was all about doing it wrong. So it sounds like you were kind of scared and, and, and as you say, threatened by him. Yeah, I would say most definitely I was, yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot older person and a man as well and I know that sounds funny but I hadn't had a great experience with men in my life so um I wasn't going to trust one at that, that time either <laughs> yeah and I suppose someone in a suit is potentially you know as you say older there's kind of like a definitely a, a authority um figure and it kind of um kind of sounds like that you also felt well it made you feel like you weren't good enough yeah definitely felt like I wasn't good enough and I know the fraud and and in some ways you are, and I think lots of business owners do that. So I had like um, a Ring Central number, so it's 0800, and it lo looks really official, but really it's just me, you know, it's all to my phone. Or people would think I'd have a premises. I don't know how I got away with this, but all through that time, I was able to divert that conversation when someone asked, Oh, have you got a, a premises? I'd go, Yeah, yeah, you know, and then I'd change the subject, but I never did. It was always from who. Um, so it was like someone could see he really knew the truth. Do you know what I mean? Whereas everyone else, they had no idea, but my customers. But he really knew.
And I, I don't think I like that. Why do you feel that you had to keep up that pretense? I don't know why I felt like that. I think I, maybe because by not admitting the truth, you're uh, not as successful as you're making out you are, I suppose, or you're not as big as you are. You Lots of small business owners don't just own the fact that they're a small business owner. They try to act like they're a, you know, a, a medium to large size company. Instead of just saying, yeah, you know, I'm proud to be a small business owner. And I think that was kind of my failure. I felt like I had to act like I was much bigger than I really was, uh, which puts a lot of pressure on yourself doing that. But it's also quite ironic as well, because, you know, you used the word earlier, fear. You know, you were fearful and scared to kind of grow, invest in a business, bring people on. But there, there's you in on some ways trying to pretend that you're a big business. Why, why was, why was there that, why was there that contradiction? Because I was just too fearful to actually employ somebody. I was just too scared to actually take someone on. I think it always comes down to uh, trust and money. You know, if I take someone on, what if they get it wrong? What if they can't do it as well as I, I can? And also, if you live inside your own head and you think, well, I've got to take time to train them or explain it. I'd rather just do it myself. Um, and that's, I think, lo I know that loads of people get stuck with that overwhelm of having to to go through those initial early stages of that trust. And then you think, oh, yeah, but this money, that money could be my money, could be in my pocket. I can't afford it. And you really do, you have to go on a journey, I think, to understand, um, to understand how crazy that is. It is like a chicken and egg situation. You do have to kind of take that leap of faith in employing someone or getting help or paying them in order to free yourself up to go and grow your business so it's like what comes first you know the money or you just have to do it and 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 know that you've got it within yourself to work really hard to bring in that extra income to now pay that person and keep growing um so yeah i think i think i, I wanted to be bigger than i really was but maybe fear was holding me back the whole time and what was that fear Maybe I was scared of success, you know. Maybe it was. It, maybe I don't want to be that person, and maybe I don't want that spotlight on me. Um, I'm not good at that kind of thing. By nature, I'm an introvert. Um, I act very confident and chat to anyone when I go out. But it's not really who I am. So maybe there was some, you know, fear of, uh, oh my God, look, and then you've got to keep that up, then, haven't you? So there might have been some of that there. You really are getting me into my psyche now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an interesting concept. I mean, it's a great book, and I can't remember if I have recommended it on the podcast before, but there's a great book um, called The The Big Leap, and he talks about uh, this, that some people have um, ceilings um, where subconsciously they have a ceiling where they, which is outside of their comfort zone, so yeah. like success is a good one, and if they get beyond that, if they actually get, you know, achieve, you know, great heights, whatever that is, like winning an Oscar, for example, yeah. that is actually outside of their comfort zone and that's above their ceiling. So then they will do something to sabot self sabotage themselves subconsciously to then bring them down into their like comfort zone. And he gave some uh, some really good examples of that in, in the book, including yeah. like Keanu Reeves, for example, who, um, was obviously very successful at one point but there's also a, I think he won a BAFTA potentially and then the next day he assaulted his like sister and and mum something like that and yeah. you know that was a um kind of an example of that that um yeah you know and does does that does that resonate at all yeah I think it does actually I think it, I think it does it is that back then it was that fear of and maybe it comes from a, a place where although I I rejected the, the negativity I had in my life um we were still really told that we weren't going to be anything and we weren't anybody and we were the scum of the earth but you know who are you that's how how I was brought up feeling that we were a mistake and myself my brother and sister and we we just a blight on everybody's lives and we've got these ragged kids that have been chucked onto the streets and now we've got to look after them and so that might that probably played its part to be honest um feeling like I could never be successful so why am I even trying well, I mean, that's um, an incredible kind of set of negative kind of stories, which I'm sure would be kind of or have been ingrained in yourself um, mm -hmm. to to kind of to then to try and overcome. Yeah, because you know, that, that that's going to be very much, as you say, ingrained in you. 
Yeah, yeah but you don't know it because I've spent my life. I'm not a negative person at all. I've never suffered with um, a lot of mental health problems or anything. I'm very just get on with it. You, know, I'm just a get on with it kind of person, and I just believe that we've all got it within us to cope and be resilient. And uh, you know, I think there's far worse situations that you could be in in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but having said that, although I've I've always thought I could achieve anything, I truly believe that. I truly believe that I can achieve anything I want to, and, and so can everybody else. And there are times where I've wanted to make things happen and I've made them happen. But at the same time, without probably knowing that I was doing it until right this moment, back then, I probably was actually putting a ceiling on, on that. You know, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it. I'm going to show you all, but only so far. Not all the way. Mm. Yeah, no, exactly. And that, and that sounds like you were doing that through, you know, as I say, n- not taking on staff, for example, um, or you know taking on the wrong staff yeah and i wanted to touch on on that because you said you you took on um family members and obviously you shared a story about you know your cousin emptying your bank account who else did you kind of take on and was there any other sort of negative impacts of of taking them on yeah absolutely so my sister was um a drug addict so um uh yeah she unfortunately followed the cycle of our lives um, and oh, stupidly though, at times I'd ask her to help, uh, which was always a stu- you know, a bad thing to do because it would either not, the work wouldn't show up on time or she was a smoker as well. So there was occasions where she'd return laundry to me and it smelled. And then I had to take that to a client and the client's been unhappy. And so again, it was like, you know, a stupid thing to do, but, but I did it because I was desperate. And I, I, I knew I couldn't turn the work around on my own. And yet I was still taking the work. Because that's another problem. That's another mistake that, that you make early in business. You don't say no. You say yes to everything. And also you drop your prices. And I did all of those stupid things instead of just saying, actually, I'm at capacity now. Um, so, yeah, I made the mistake of taking her on. Um, and that was probably it, really. They're probably the only people I um, I even let in the door, to be honest with you. So essentially two family members. Or in, in, in that eight years, was it only two people that... In that age, later on, uh, when I was pregnant, I actually uh, took on my stepdaughter and my husband's ex-wife because uh, we're friendly. And uh, they were fine. They were great. They never let me down or anything like that. They they wanted to help because they knew the situation with the baby. Um, and they did that for a while until they didn't need to do it anymore. I didn't need them anymore, anymore because I outsourced. So that wasn't a mistake, luckily. But... Um, yeah, those early days. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I always say to people, don't take on family and friends. It's, it's a, it's not a good mix. At all. Do you think? Do you? Yeah. Do you sort of stand by? You know, don't mix business and kind of pressure and and friends and stuff. Yeah, because I actually wrote a post about this like a, um, a, a while back, and still, because I'm, I'm quite, um, I'm driven by my my compassion and the way I feel about people, and I still made the mistake against my better judgment in my new my now business of taking on a family member i cannot go into details unfortunately but let's just say it ended horrifically so uh it is a it is something i would just say just don't do it it it, it just it blurs too many lines and you end up having to have all all you know awkward and difficult conversations and it can ruin those relationships so so i would just say steer clear do you think it? Do you think it can work under certain right circumstances if it's set up, or do you would you just say uh, to avoid it? I think if that person was in the profession, let, you know that that let's say you're all in a business and your brother-in-law is an accountant, for example, and you need an accountant, then then it can work really well. Uh, especially if you define, you know, the the agreements up front. You're not going to talk about this in family, you know, meetings or family gatherings, things like that. Um, or if you're a really confident person and you're not scared of confrontation and, and having those difficult conversations. But if you aren't, if you know up front that, that having to ha- have those conversations is going to be difficult, then just don't even don't even go down that path. It's just not worth it. Uh, if you're quite a ballsy person and you've got no problem looking that family member in the eye and saying something, then it's up to you. But if they don't have the skills and they don't have the qualifications, what you need to, you have to pick the right people. It's not, it's not, it's not, you know, picking someone just because they're there and they're a body. They still have to have that skill set. And I'm curious, what do you think, or 
what would you have ch have achieved if you had followed a different path for that first eight years and actually taken on staff, you know, grown the business, invested, taken some risk? What, where do you think that business would have gone? I think it could have gone, uh, you know, to the moon. I really do because I would have been able to uh, scale at, at a different level, probably taken on that unit, invested in the industrial equipment that was needed, got the first van driver, we cover in a certain area, and I think then we could have then maybe had a fleet of vehicles, more staff, um, taken on more business. We would have gone into dry cleaning, so we wouldn't have needed to outsource that in the end. So I think it could have been, it would have been more profitable from the point of view of making it a saleable asset. So even if I'd have left it, I'd have sold it for a lot more than I ended up selling it for where I did. Um, so I think it could have done, could have done a lot. Uh, I could have done a lot with that business, really. Yeah, and I would have been able to just manage it and just lead it rather than having to be in, in it doing the actual physical work. Did you ever feel that you took any risks? Oh, probably not as many as I should have done in that business, actually. No, in, in the business I'm in now, yeah, loads. But in that business, I probably did play it safe. I thought I was playing it safe, actually. You're not, are you? You're actually taking a big risk every time you don't take someone and every time you try to do it all yourself, that is the risk itself. So I probably did. Yeah, because I mean, you said you know you said you the, the words you used earlier. I took the easy route by employing employing your own family, and uh, I think you did use the word kind of playing it safe earlier. Um, but it's kind of interesting because you also said on the, on the other hand that you know you've got a belief that you know life is too short and you're all about taking risks. But yeah. do you think that? And it sounds like you've definitely very much got that and everything that you've done. You know, you were talking about your attitude and. Um, the things you've done with your kids and the attitude towards, you know, um, parenting. But do you think that you've kind of separated some of those things or do you think that you're just in a completely different mindset now to where you were um, previously? I think I've grown. I'm a lot older now. I'm a double the age I was then. So I think I've just grown with experience. And that initial mindset I had is more, it was there, it was always there, it's always been there. But it's 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 uh, matured, and I'm a lot more. I don't care what people think anymore. You know, that that's, that kind of thing doesn't bother me. I'm very much if something's not good in my life, I'm just going to get it out of my life. Whether that's friends, whether that's um, a situation, it's just gone. Um, I think you just that happens as you get older. I think you just become you know yourself more. You know what your limitations are and your boundaries, and you're not afraid to put them in place. But actually, I think that does come from running a business and making mistakes. If I hadn't made those mistakes, I'd probably be making them now instead. But now I know what my worth is. I know what my boundaries are. And I'm not going to let anyone barter me down on prices. But back then, I was completely green to it all. So I just said yes to anything. <laughs> and I think the price conversation is an interesting one. So can we, t we talk about that? So what what happened in that circumstance? You know, how did you get persuaded to essentially re reduce your prices yeah so i might have tried something like i don't know it was like let's say 15 pound for or 10 pounds for 15 items or something like that and they go oh can't you do it for this kind of that and i was so scared of saying no in case that person then said well i'm, I'm not going to go with you then then i'd always say yes um and it wasn't until much much later in the business that i was like no i'm not moving on those policies whatsoever at all and that's also about knowing your numbers. And maybe I, and I definitely didn't know my numbers as well as I should have done. You know, you're not factoring in the cost of the mileage and the cost of the equipment and the cost of your time and your experience. And and so when that person's bartered you down, you're probably making absolutely nothing. So, yeah, I um, I was just fear, though. It's that fear of I really need this business so I can't say no. And not knowing who your right customers are, who you align with. Whereas now I'd turn people down. If, they, if they're... If I don't like the way they operate or they're not in an ethical business, I'm going to say no every day of the week, regardless of the price tag. And because I think um, from an integrity point of view, but also to, to sleep at night, you have to have that about you. Yeah, I, I think the reason I asked, I know it's such a common thing for new businesses and new, new entrepreneurs at the beginning to be persuaded on price. But also, secondly, not charge what they should be charging. And that's yeah, because they yeah. don't value their time, efforts, and they don't see the value in their services. 
And it's also a confidence thing, I think. Yeah, definitely. I absolutely agree with that. So when I first started this business, I mean, now I charged a lot less, but I was building my experience. And the minute I did, I moved those prices right up there to, you know, what's what's the average in my field and probably a little bit more. Uh, now I won't get out of bed for a certain hourly rate mm. because that's what I'm worth and that's what my knowledge and expertise is worth. Um, you do have to be brave and you do have to say, be brave enough to say no and know that the right person is going to come along. But if you're going to say yes to somebody and it's a lower price, you've now said no to the next customer that comes along that would have paid more because you've not got the capacity for them. Mm. So I think you have to remember if you're saying you know, if you're, if you're doing that, what are you going to miss out on? It is a tough thing. It really is tough when you're starting out. No, definitely. But you've got more worth, yeah. You mentioned earlier, you said you made quite a few mistakes during, you know, during that business. But what do you think was the biggest one? God, you know what? It probably would be not investing that money the way it was meant to be invested. I think that's my biggest mistake because that could have been the turning point. Uh, I think I would have been forced then into having to take on staff um so that would have been definitely i think that is my biggest mistake actually yeah so we've talked a lot about fear today what advice would you give to entrepreneurs about handling the fear of failure do you know what if you don't take risks if you don't try if you don't make mistakes you're never going to grow that business anyway um stephen bartley talks a lot about um about the taking those kind of risks the type what type one type two risks where you know you can go back if you have to. You know, it's undoable. And if you don't make, I mean, like there's, there's companies like Amazon that actually have a department for failing, for experiments. So you have to treat them as experiments and know that they're not failures, they're experiments. You tried a route, it didn't work, brilliant, move on to the next route. And I've just done that in the business I'm in now. I've made a mistake in this business, but I'm so glad that I've done it. I can I, Instead of the last business where I'll stick with it now and keep making that mistake for 10 years, that's it. We're done with that one. Let's get rid of that. It was an experiment. Let's move on to the next one. So you have to treat it as an experiment and know that it can either work or fail. But if it works, how good could that be? You know, how amazing could that be? And if you fail, brilliant, you know, not to do it again and move on to the next thing. So you don't don't treat it as fail. You treat it as an experiment to lead you on the path to success. I think that's good advice. And can you talk about that recent um, experiment or, or failure? Yes, yeah, so the business now that I run, it's a VA agency, so personal assistants working remotely for business owners. And we help business owners like the way I was with your admin, but more technical stuff as well. I, I help put systems and processes through automation in place and websites and all that kind of stuff. So there's loads of stuff that we do. You end up running, you know, the business operations really. Um, but I wanted to scale much quicker and I knew the way to do that from my past experience was to outsource faster. So that's what I did straight away. And it's been great. I've been on this great trajectory. And up until last Monday, I had a team of nine people and we're less than three years in. Uh, however, those people are associates. They're not employees. And the business model just isn't working. So I just I was starting to get to a point where we was going up and then it was coming down. And I thought, well, what what is it? So I you know, ran the numbers, done some data analysis. I'm just doing a lean management course at the moment. So using some of the Kaizen approaches to figuring out what it is that that was going wrong and the correlation there was really between taking on associates who aren't employees so they don't have that loyalty to you that they do to their own business and some of them have been amazing don't get me wrong they're absolutely brilliant at what they do but unfortunately you can't control them in a way you can your staff and so they would let the clients down or they were letting me down and I just thought enough is enough it's not worth this stress I've got to bring the business back to basics sack off the associates, suck those customers back in as my own and start again. And so uh, that's kind of what I've done. It's better for me. I've got more money coming in because all those all those overheads have gone. But eventually I'll try again, but with employees rather than associates. So I think it's great. I tried the model. doesn't work. I'll move on. Try, try the next thing. No, that's a great uh, case study of, you know, and it really illustrates the point that you're making as well. So last question, if you could go back in time and erase that first eight years of that business happening and, and the mistakes that you made, would you take it? So would you completely delete it from ever happening? No, I wouldn't. 
I wouldn't. I wouldn't be the business owner I am today otherwise. I wouldn't know what I know. It's given me so much knowledge and experience. Um, I'm a totally different person now. Completely different business owner. Uh, I know what I'm doing, and uh, and I wouldn't have been able to turn the charity into the success it was either that that I ran, and I was passionate about running that for eight years. So no, it's part of my journey. Absolutely not. Fantastic. <laughs> So, um, like wrapping up, we always end on a, a quick fire round. Um, and so this is short questions and short answers. So question one, failure is? Success. What's your life's mission? To be happy. What's one piece of advice you'd give to other people on your deathbed? Don't get caught up in the small stuff. Live your life. Name one habit that keeps you resilient. That's a tough one. One habit that keeps just being positive, seeing the positive seeing things. If you could be immortal, would you take it? Could I be young forever? <laughs> <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> Probably, if it meant that we could all be um, immortal or I could spend that time with my children forever, then yeah. But otherwise, I, th- I believe there's something else out there. So. And if you could swap places with another business person in the world, anyone, who would it be? Uh, Stephen Bartley, just for one day. I'd love to have a glimpse into his life. Why? I think he's really inspiring. For a young person, he's really inspiring. And he, I, I feel a connection to him because of some of the things he talks about, particularly when it comes to death and being, non, being un, an awareness of it that a lot of people don't have because it really resounds with me. So probably for that reason. So, Lisa, where can people find you and connect with you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Lisa Tennant, uh, LTVA Services, uh, Instagram, just LTVA Services, uh, or you can go and get yourself some freebies from our website, LTVAServices.com. That's a VA for virtual assistant, not VA or anything else. <laughs> Don't want to get those too confused. Amazing. No. Lisa, thanks so much for being here and... You know, it's been a very candid conversation, so I really appreciate your your honesty and talking about lots of difficult um, topics today. Um, I know a lot of people will get um, a lot from that, so thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.